There is a gold-bearing river in Victoria that we already know exists, that appears in official geological records, and that was never mined by anyone. It has no name, no shaft, no recorded ounces, and no place in the state's gold history, despite sitting beneath one of the most mineralized pieces of ground in the region. It runs beneath Spring Hill, directly under what is now the Lauriston Reservoir, and it represents one of the strangest oversights in Victorian gold geology. This isn't a lost lead, it's a documented one. It's logged in Geovic as a buried Paleo Valley, acknowledged just enough to exist on paper, and then quietly left alone. No mining attempts, no lease boundaries cutting across it, no historical footnote explaining why it was abandoned, just a geological trace of an ancient river system that once flowed here, carried gold, and was then sealed off before anyone could reach it. We can use magnetics to peel back the layers and get a glimpse of the lead. Here it is, sticking out like a sore thumb. And the moment you see it, the question stops being where the gold exists here, and becomes why this system was never touched at all. For starters, I'm going to call this lead the Spring Hill Deep Lead, and the surface geology immediately tells you that this area should not be ignored. Quartz reefs outcrop around the margins of the Lauriston Reservoir, and they are not the kind of quartz you associate with barren systems. They are mineralized, structured, and persistent, indicating prolonged fluid movement through the bedrock. In most Victorian goldfields, quartz like this was enough to trigger intense prospecting and deep underground development. Here it didn't. That silence is geological information in itself. I suspect the reason it didn't is because those veins were buried beneath soil prior to the creation of the reservoir. After the waterline rose, it scoured the banks and revealed the mineralized quartz veins hidden beneath cover. But to truly understand why this lead was missed, you have to stop looking at the surface and start thinking in time slices. Long before the modern landscape existed, this part of Victoria was cut by a substantial river system. Not a shallow creek, but a true paleo valley capable of carving into bedrock and trapping dense minerals over immense periods of time. These are the same kind of systems that elsewhere became Victoria's great deep leads, producing extraordinary amounts of gold once they were discovered and mined. Those rivers didn't vanish they were buried. Spring Hill sits in a part of Victoria that experienced volcanism after the gold-bearing river system had already formed. Lava arrived late, and it arrived in a way that fundamentally altered access rather than destroying what lay beneath. Lava flows do not move randomly across the landscape. They seek low ground. They flood valleys. They pull where rivers once ran. If there was ever a geological process capable of preserving a deep lead while simultaneously hiding it from view, this was it. This is where Icelandite becomes critical. I've already made a dedicated video on the Icelandite at Spring Hill, which is one of the rarest volcanic rocks in Victoria, and I'll link that video in the description because it matters here far more than most people realize. Icelandite is not typical basalt. It's a chemically distinct, intermediate lava, transitional between basalt and rhyolite, and it behaves very differently when it erupts. It is thicker, more viscous, and far more prone to ponding and infilling than spreading thinly across high ground. When Icelandite erupted here, it didn't skim over ridges. It flowed into depressions. It filled valleys. Any pre-existing Paleo Valley would have been one of the first places it accumulated. Later basalt flows then reinforced that burial, sealing the system beneath the hard volcanic cap that effectively erased the river from the surface expression of the landscape. So by the time prospectors arrived in the 1850s, the river was already gone. The gravels were buried, the pay streaks were sealed, and above them sat meters to tens of meters of volcanic rock that could not be economically penetrated without strong evidence of what lay beneath. Miners were not ignorant, but they were practical. They followed exposed leads. They worked shallow ground. They chased reefs that could be accessed with shafts, drives, and timber. That is why this lead exists in the records, but not in the mines. Its presence on Geovic tells us that geologists later recognized the system for what it was. Its absence from mining history tells us it was either never suspected to exist, or it was never feasible to test with 19th century technology. And the fact that it has no name tells us something even more revealing. In Victoria, leads earn names through use, through production, through attention. Anonymous leads are the ones that were seen, acknowledged, and then left behind. This one sits exactly in that category. What makes it even more compelling is that this Paleo Valley does not exist in isolation. Its orientation and position strongly suggest it connects into the broader Colobin Campaspe lead system, one of the major deep lead networks that was mined elsewhere in Victoria. This is the Colobin Campaspe lead on magnetics, and as you can see, the Spring Hill deep lead flowed directly towards it. 
The Colobin Compaspi D-Bleed system produced gold where it was accessible, where volcanic cover was thinner or absent, and where shafts could reach the gravels. If the Spring Hill D-Bleed is part of that same drainage network, which it strongly appears to be, then we're not looking at a marginal offshoot. We're looking at a preserved segment of a proven gold system that simply passed beneath the wrong kind of rock at the wrong time. In other words, the gold didn't stop flowing. Axis did. The structural setting reinforces this interpretation. Spring Hill is located near major fault zones that cut through the region. These faults are not incidental features. They are deep, long-lived structures that act as conduits for hydrothermal fluids rising from depth. In gold systems, faults like these are the plumbing. They provide the pathway that allow gold-bearing fluids to move upward, interact with the bedrock, and deposit mineralization. This is why the quartz reefs around the reservoir are there at all. They mark zones where fluids exploited structural weaknesses, precipitating quartz and associated minerals as pressure and chemistry changed. Those same fluids would have enriched the bedrock beneath the Paleo Valley and contributed gold to the river system as it eroded and reworked the landscape. The faults fed the system, the river concentrated it, the volcanic sealed it. That combination is rare, and it is powerful. It also explains why the quartz alone never led to major mining here. The reefs are not the prize, they are the margins. The gold accumulates in the river gravels, where gravity, density and time do the work that fluids alone cannot. So what you're seeing at Spring Hill is not an underwhelming gold field, it is an incomplete one. The modern landscape adds another layer to this story. The Lauriston Reservoir occupies a natural low point, and modern drainage often inherits ancient pathways even when those pathways are buried. Water finds weakness, it finds depth. Reservoirs are rarely placed arbitrarily, they exploit natural basins. The fact that this reservoir sits directly over a recorded Paleo Valley is not a coincidence. It is the surface expression of a much older landscape that still controls the shape of the land today. And this is where magnetics becomes essential. Basalt and Icelandite are magnetic. Ancient river sediments are not. When a volcanic rock fills a valley carved into bedrock and underlain by sediment, it creates a magnetic contrast that can be detected from the surface. The lava produces a strong magnetic signal. The sediment-filled channel beneath produces a relative low. The edges of the valley produce gradients. In effect, the buried river draws its own outline, if you know how to read it. Magnetic surveys have already proven their value in mapping buried deep leads elsewhere in Victoria, particularly where volcanic cover obscures everything at the surface. In this case, magnetics is not about discovering whether the lead exists. We already know it does. It's about refining it, tracing its exact course, identifying where it deepens, widens, or changes character. And most importantly, understanding how it relates to the surrounding faults, reefs, and bedrock architecture. If the magnetic data confirms what the records, structures, and surface geology already imply, then the Spring Hill Deep Lead represents something genuinely rare in Victoria. A preserved lead within a proven gold system that was never mined, never dewatered, never collapsed, and never reworked. Its gravels are still intact. Its pay streaks are still where the river left them. Its gold is exactly where it settled millions of years ago. This is not about rewriting gold history. It's about recognizing a blind spot in it. Spring Hill wasn't ignored because it lacked gold. It was ignored because it was sealed at the wrong time, by the wrong rock, in the wrong place. The Icelandite didn't destroy the system. It protected it. The basalt didn't sterilize it. It hid it. And the absence of mining didn't mean failure. It meant preservation. What we're doing now is not chasing a myth or inventing a lost river. We're taking a recorded but unnamed lead seriously for the first time, using tools that finally allow us to see through the rock that kept it out of reach. If the magnetics line up with the geology, then this Paleo Valley beneath Spring Hill may turn out to be one of the most intact gold systems Victoria never mined. Not because it wasn't there, but because it was too well hidden to touch. And that's what makes it one of the most interesting leads in the state. I hope you found this as interesting as I did. And as always, thanks for watching. Before I end this video, I'd like to give a big shout out to my Patreon and YouTube members. Thank you so much to everyone that helps to support this channel.